Welcome to the happiest place on earth. On July 24, 1966, Walt Disney and then Mayor of New Orleans Victor H. Shiro unveiled New Orleans Square, a new French Quarter-themed land at the Disneyland Park in Anaheim, California. According to film historian and Disney biographer Richard Schickel, The mayor of the real New Orleans thought to compliment the creator of the imitation by saying, It looks just like home. To which the imitator replied, with more than a trace of self-satisfaction, Well, I'd say it's a lot cleaner. And thus, unto the world, he gave us the Disney version of New Orleans. You're probably familiar with several Disney versions, things that have undergone a process of Disneyfication, transformation into something carefully controlled, safe, and pleasant. There's Disney versions of castles, Disney versions of dinosaurs, Disney versions of Abe Lincoln. Solvang, California is like a Disney version of Denmark. Yu-Gi-Oh! is like a Disney version of Magic the Gathering. Many Disney films are the Disney versions of fairy tales. The word Disney is so culturally and politically charged in a way no other Hollywood studio, no other multinational conglomerate is. It's a corporate brand so iconic that it's sort of its own genre, its own classification. There isn't a Warner Brothers version, there isn't an MGM version, there isn't really a universal version, except for maybe if you're talking specifically about movie monsters, but when you say something is a Disney version, everyone knows exactly what you mean. The Disney brand is associated with nostalgia, with wishes coming true, with dreams, family values, a kind of middle-class conservatism, optimism, and Americana. But like, why? And how did Disney, the company and the man, become so intertwined with these ideas in the public consciousness? How does a brand so invested in nostalgia depict and engage with our shared past? How will its utter cultural and economic dominance impact our future? And how do we, or should we, internalize the Disney versions of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy? Well, let's start this dog and pony show at the very beginning, with the man himself. Dum, da, da, dum, da, 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 da. Like the company that is his namesake, Walt Disney has become something of a mythic figure in the business. Once household names like Cecil B. DeMille and Jack L. Warner were just as responsible for overseeing artistic and technological breakthroughs in the infant film industry, but no one thinks either of their cryogenically frozen heads is knocking around in a refrigerated storage unit under the Pirates of the Caribbean. Walt Disney succeeded so effectively in associating his name with nostalgia and good old-fashioned clean family fun that he's remembered by some as this whimsical, avuncular, aging Peter Pan figure, a genius and self-made millionaire who never lost his childlike spark, and by others as the exact inverse of that, the kind of perverse evil genius hellbent on world domination who would cryogenically freeze his own head and stick it under a children's ride. The truth is, he was neither of those things, the Uncle Walt image being a very carefully constructed persona. I've worked my whole life to create the image of what Walt Disney is. It's not me. I smoke, I drink, and all the things we don't want the public to think about. Before I met him, Aubrey Menon reports, every effort was made by his aides to impress me that Walt Disney was in fact avuncular. He was open and affable, they said, and easy to talk to. Instead. I met a tall, somber man who appeared to be under the lash of some private demon. I remember him smiling only once, and he is not at ease. Other studios used their PR departments to carefully construct and protect the images of stars contracted to them. Your Clark Gables, your Judy Garlands. Disney's PR department serviced the mouse, the duck, and the man, Disney himself. And they worked overtime. No other studio put out more words of public relations copy, yet none was less informative than this highly secretive organization. In the early days of the studio, no animator's name was credited on a reel, only Disney's. And even as the studio started producing live-action films in the 1950s and 60s, it was Disney's name that received top billing. He preferred to cast his films with stars that were on the way up or on the way down in their careers, both for their cost-effectiveness and for branding. 
Mary Poppins and Treasure Island were Disney films before they were Julie Andrews and Robert Newton films, respectively. Walt reported that he never made a picture that he didn't want his family to see, and the X factor to his ultimate success was how American midstream his attitudes and tastes were, and the brand recognition he built with all that was wholesome and childlike and middle America became a force unto itself, chiseling and refining an image of the genius mythic Walt in the public consciousness, the man-child who captured childhood in a bottle and sold it back to us. Midway into his success, Walt seemingly felt boxed in by his mythic persona. After a private screening of Robert Mulligan's To Kill a Mockingbird starring Gregory Peck, Disney allegedly lamented, That was one hell of a picture. That's the kind of film I wish I could make. But later in his career, Walt seemed settled into his self-imposed artistic niche. I don't like depressing pictures. I don't like pest holes. I don't like pictures that are dirty. I don't ever go out and pay money for studies in abnormality. I don't have depressed moods and I don't want to have any. I'm happy, just very, very happy. The real Walt wasn't even a particularly good cartoonist, a fact that was the source of great consternation to him in his later career. Allegedly, he even went so far as to take a few drawing lessons from some of his animators in his later life so that he wouldn't be caught out when one of his young fans asked him to draw a picture of Mickey or Donald. His success in heading an animation studio seems to have come, from the very start, from a rigid adherence to quality and attention to detail that resulted in the studio running on razor-thin profit margins during its early days. It's almost comical to think of now, but almost every aspect of Disney's money-printing empire during his lifetime, cartoons, theme parks, audio animatronics, did start as his weird, nerdy passion projects he was willing to risk everything for. And the avuncular, kind, patriarch persona seems to have sprung out of this early period in the studio's history when Walt oversaw a boys' club of young animators who were stretching the bounds of the nascent art form. But Walt was infamously stingy with compliments, even then, and even his most adoring protégés would have probably characterized him more like a kind of hard-ass college professor you always had to work really hard to impress than the mythic Uncle Walt he appeared to be in public. A journalist visiting the Disney studio during Disney's later years recalled, Being warned by a secretary to be sure to accept the glass of tomato juice Disney habitually offered his luncheon guests in his office before taking them over to the commissary. The man inquired what would happen if he turned down the proffered refreshment. I suggest you just take the tomato juice, the girl said with a cool finality. The journalist detected a distinct change in the atmosphere when Disney entered the dining room a little while later. Everyone's voice shot up about two octaves, he recalled. All the women began sounding like Minnie Mouse. All the guys started sounding like Porky Pig. For when Uncle Walt came around, anxiety came with him. And like army privates who feel the eyes of the sergeant upon them, his people tended to get very busy very, very preoccupied, hoping they would not be singled out for his attention. And yet, the authentic Walt sometimes used his sadistic, corporate, unapproved powers for good. Another possibly apocryphal anecdote relates a time a Disney executive hollered out his window at a gardener to stop mowing the lawn, for which the young executive was called into the boss's office, said Disney. Now you spoke harshly to that man. He's been with me for 20 years. I don't want it to happen again. And there's another thing I want you to remember. There's only one SOB at this studio, and that's me. What a banger from Walter Elias Disney. I... We contain multitudes, I guess. Following the 1937 release of the studio's first feature-length film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the studio grew in size, but the labor demands on the artists working for Disney intensified, while wages were all over the map. Disney no longer had time to build and maintain personal relationships with all of his staff, but wages were determined on a case-by-case -case basis favoring the animators Walt had had personal relationships with, ultimately leading to internal tensions at the studio that culminated in a labor strike in 1941. There's an amazing Defunct Land video about it. Go, go watch it. Seriously, it's... it's just like one of the best pieces of content on youtube.com. Ultimately, the unionists won when the National Labor Relations Board asked Disney to sign a union contract and he agreed. But Disney took the strike personally, carrying a strong grudge against individual strikers and a lifelong contempt for unions that played a not insignificant role in his friendly collaboration with the House of Un-American Activities Committee. He would later claim that the Disney animator strikes were essentially astroturfed. 
I took photographs of those picket lines, and I studied those photos. I'd never seen half of those faces. They'd never been near my studio when I showed them to the FBI and the investigators for the California Un-American Activities Committee. I was told the fellows in those photos have been in every strike Sorrell is called. If there was one aspect of the authentic Walt Disney's ethos that permeated every aspect of his company then, as it does today, it's that of control. Control of his image, control of the new technologies he was developing, control of industry. The Disney company developed some of the very first in nature documentaries, but desiring them to fit a more structured Hollywood narrative, Disney controlled nature itself through the use of clever editing, scoring, and most infamously, faking mass lemming suicide. (laughs) Toward the end of his life, Disney was hard at work developing his experimental prototype community of tomorrow, his own little city he'd have complete and utter control over that he'd never live to see. But Disneyland is perhaps the most obvious and tangible surviving expression of his ethos of control. His own little world that he could order precisely as he wanted to, replete with a new and improved clean version of New Orleans and an idealized version of his hometown, Marceline, Missouri. Main Street USA isn't quite Marceline. It's sort of an amalgam of -of turn-of-the-century aesthetics plucked from a number of sources, including designer Harper Goff's hometown of Fort Collins, Colorado, and the Henry Ford Museum complex in Dearborn, Michigan. Through it, Disney created a kind of utopian ideal of his own childhood, which was not, in reality, a very happy one. His father was a violent alcoholic who beat him and his mother, two of his older brothers were permanently estranged from the family, and in one alleged incident, the boy Disney was ganged up on and subjected to what was described by Richard Schickel as a quasi-sexual assault. But the Disney version of childhood is one under the auteur's strict control, wherein everything is pretty and the only dangers are thrills signposted by their very artifice. It's almost sweet, this idea of trying to recreate the happy parts of the past and ignore the bad parts. And the impulse clearly stemmed from such a personal place for Disney, like... Fascistic tendencies aside, I feel for Disney's desire to try to protect and relive what was good about his childhood in spite of its difficulties. This is part of what makes the Disney brand so alluring. Disney adults like me, we we know it's fake. We understand that the Disney versions of history and culture are revisionist. We know that the crocodiles in the Jungle Cruise and the unceasing pleasantness of Main Street USA are likewise artificial. We understand that it's all fantasy, not just fantasy land. But I can also admit that waving everything away is a bit of fun and artifice is a bit of a cop-out. So let's talk about the Disney versions of history. In 2017, the Walt Disney Company announced that it would be temporarily closing the Pirates of the Caribbean attractions in Walt Disney World, Disneyland, and Disneyland Paris for refurbishment, including an overhaul and redesign of the attraction's classic wench auction scene. So, of course, the history defenders logged on. Unpopular opinion. Updates to the Pirates of the Caribbean bothers me. I understand that social modes have changed, but we can't just rewrite history and ignore historically accuracy for the time period. I'm a huge supporter of women's rights, but why pretend they've always existed? We, uh, we, uh, we shouldn't erase history. There's no reason to revise history. Sanitizing an attraction about pirates who died of syphilis and in poverty was done by Mark Davis in the 1960s. The next to be replaced will be the drinking scene with an AA meeting where the pirates state their names and ask the villagers for forgiveness. History! Leave it alone! I'm a redhead, and this is history. Are we going to rewrite all history now? Hashtag Pirates of the Caribbean. It's part of history. You can't change that. It's history. Pirates aren't friendly. They weren't then, and they aren't now. Kids are smart and don't need coddling. If it brings up the conversation of sex trafficking, then it's a good time to talk about that and teach your kids safety skills. If not, then just have fun in the ride. I'm going to try that again. I'm sorry. (laughs) I just love this idea of it's a good time to talk to your kids about sex trafficking. (laughs) Disney World. Anyway. So let's fucking rumble, history buffs. Let's talk about the historicity of the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. 
The Pirates of the Caribbean is a dark ride style attraction, an indoor, typically slow moving ride through a sequence of show scenes that first opened at the Disneyland Park in 1967. The setting for the show scenes is somewhere sort of vaguely in the Greater Antilles, some when vaguely in the Golden Age of Piracy. I mean, most of the costume pieces on the animatronics have that kind of, the eighth grade musical is all over this year and we told the parents to pitch in with goodwill pieces vibe, but we can at least glean from the tricorn hats that we're looking at 17th or early 18th century. The first iteration of the ride featured pirates drinking, burning part of a city to the ground, singing a merry tune about being pirates, selling hats, chasing women, and holding the aforementioned bride auction. In the spirit of a fair and balanced historical analysis, we'll just assume that the song Yo-Ho, Yo-Ho, A Pirate's Life for Me is not diegetic and strike it from the list for historical review. While some pirates did indeed rape, there were still pirate codes among crews that outlawed it. Both pirate captain John Phillips and pirate queen Ching Shi executed rapists. And while modern pirates do engage in human trafficking, I'm not sure if I've ever heard of a pirate staging an elaborate bride auction featuring a bunch of tied up sobbing white women. Wife sales did exist in England, but they usually weren't sex trafficking, more like a cheeky, semi-formalized loophole for dissolving a marriage before no-fault divorce was a thing. Husbands would sell their wives, but it usually wasn't to some rando, it was to the guy the wife was stooping. Hubby would get paid off by his wife's lover to make a public show out of stepping out of the marriage, and she would belong to her new man. The Pirates of the Caribbean ride has been tweaked several times throughout the years, most notably in the mid-1990s where the first few changes were made to render the children's ride a little bit less rapey. Pirates that had previously been chasing women with implied lascivious intent were now chasing women holding plates of yummy food they wanted to put in their pirate tummies. And an animatronic woman hiding from her would-be rapist in a barrel was replaced with a kitty cat. The next biggest refurbishment to the Pirates of the Caribbean ride came in the early 2000s, after the first two entries in the film trilogy based on the ride made roughly $2.5 gajillion and earned an Academy Award nomination for Johnny Depp. So, you know, they had to have their depths. They had to put in some depths. The Pirates of the Caribbean Italicized is a series of financially lucrative and once critically well-received films set just after the Golden Age of Piracy, roughly sometime between 1720 and 1750. Though the film series heavily features supernatural and fantasy elements, it's more rooted in a time period than the ride and features real historical places and ships like the lost Jamaican village of Port Royal and the Queen Anne's Revenge, as well as characters based on historical pirates like Ching Shi, Chiang Po Tsai, and Blackbeard. The big bad in the second and third installments of the series is a chairman of the infamous British Joint Stock Corporation, the East India Company. The historicity of the film suffers from some of the usual structural timeline stretching that occurs in Hollywood period narratives. Characters based on living people are alive at times they wouldn't have been, or ages they wouldn't have been, as well as the usual pop history misconceptions. <laughs> They didn't wear corsets, Keira Knightley, you'd be wearing stays, and stays don't suck you in and make it hard to breathe, they just provide structure for your garment. But really, these little details and anachronisms kind of pale in comparison to the depiction of the East India Company itself. Because even though they are antagonists, the series of films shied away from depicting the one thing that made the East India Company so uniquely evil. An absence in the narrative that's especially notable because key scenes in the Pirates movies take place on Tortuga, an island that forms part of Haiti, a nation where hundreds of thousands of the human beings the East India Company transported and sold into slavery would successfully revolt a mere 40 to 50-ish years after the conclusion of the Pirates franchise. There is a deleted scene from the third film in the series, At World's End, in which Johnny Depp references the East India Company's participation in the slave trade. I contracted you to deliver cargo on my behalf. You chose to liberate it. People aren't cargo, mate. But the line was ultimately cut from the film. And to have a narrative set in a time and place during which some of the greatest atrocities known to humanity were taking place, dealing directly with one of the major perpetrators of those atrocities, but to not even give them a passing mention feels like an oversight that is bordering on unethical. But hoots, you may be yelling at your television and or computer screen. If depictions of rape and human trafficking are inappropriate for a children's ride, 
then surely depictions of the brutal slave trade are inappropriate for a swashbuckling summer blockbuster. And you'd be right. And that kind of cuts to the heart of the issue here. Disney's historical depictions are couched in narrative, be it the setting for an adventure film, the Old West as it existed in the imaginations of little boys in the 1950s, or turn-of-the-century America as a middle-aged man liked to remember it had been. An amount of revisionism and bias are expected even in the most rigorous historical accounts, but it's a downright necessary part of effective storytelling. And that's without even beginning to factor in the sort of metatextual narrative of the corporation responsible for doing the storytelling, as this wellspring of all that is good and whimsical and wholesome helmed by a mythic uncle figure. That is, of course, the Jungian unconscious uncle for all my um, mythopoeticism fans. Disney's historical and cultural revisionism is most often criticized in relationship to its perceived corporate cynicism, and, I mean, it should be. But I think what often gets overlooked in discussions of its handling of history is how narrative framing is necessary, not just in terms of Disney functioning as a brand, but in how storytelling works, period. And while we're holding Disney's feet to the fire about historical inaccuracies, we should really interrogate if theirs are the most responsible hands, or four-fingered white gloves, to place all historical narratives in. In the 1990s, during Tsar Michael Eisner's reign at the Walt Disney Company, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts announced plans to develop a new theme park called Disney's America. The park was to be an American history-themed attraction located in Haymarket, Virginia, a mere five miles from the location of the historic Battles of Manassas. Yep, come on down to Disney's America, just off Interstate 66. If you pass the memorial site for the 25,000 dead men and boys, you've gone too far. Take a picture with Mickey Mouse in a tricorn hat, then ride on the industrial sweatshop roller coaster. Don't forget to stop in Native America for a photo op with Sacagawea at the Lewis and Clark expedition. And if you need to slow things down a bit, grab a turkey leg and wander on down to our slave exhibit. Jesus Christ. The proposed project was met with a great deal of opposition, both due to its location near, I have to stress this again, an actual Civil War battleground, and because of the park's plans to... We want to make you a Civil War soldier. We want to make you feel what it was like to be a slave. What it was like to escape to the Underground Railroad. Obviously, the commodification of some of the most painful parts of our history as chintzy amusement park entertainment seemed to some a little gauche, and the project was eventually canceled. To paraphrase New Jersey Senator Robert Torricelli at the time, Civil War history should not be taught by Minnie and Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. While I completely agree with Senator Torricelli here, I feel like we've kind of missed an opportunity to see what color Civil War uniforms each of the Disney Five would have worn. I'm gonna guess uh, Minnie Blue, uh, Goofy Blue, Donald Gray, Pluto, Blue Bandana, and Mickey, controversial but gray. Circling back to the Pirates of the Caribbean films, this is kind of why any Disney depiction of that time and place in history is difficult no matter which way you slice it. Ultimately, I kind of view the absence of the East India Company's participation in the slave trade from the films the same way I view Samantha's absence from the reboot of Sex and the City. Painfully apparent and making me question why this even has to exist in this way in the first place, but recognizing that it was probably one right decision in a melange of more questionable decisions. But that Jack Sparrow sure is fun and cheeky. Fun guy, that Jack Sparrow. I think it's important to remain critical of the Disney versions of history while also not losing focus on what a given narrative's goals are and how responsible we can expect Disney to be with more sensitive cultural topics especially in the midst of the company's recent push to be more inclusive that has garnered some mixed results. Disney is still a multinational conglomerate that seeks to trademark and commodify everything it touches. Disney is still an American entertainment company that passes every story through a Hollywood screenwriting structure filter. Disney has still staked a lot of its brand on the aesthetics of a period scrubbed clean of any unfortunate implications. The ironic thing about the change to the auction scene in the Pirates ride is that now it feels, if anything, a little more historically accurate, Red's feisty persona being very clearly inspired by the historical pirate Anne Bonny. The next big controversial change to a Disney attraction on its way is a complete retheming of Splash Mountain. From a log flume ride featuring characters based on Disney's Song of the South, a film universally reviled for its whitewashed depiction of the antebellum South, 
to a log flume ride based on The Princess and the Frog, a film that received a good deal of criticism for its whitewashed depiction of the Jim Crow era South. Baby steps. I don't necessarily think it's reasonable or even appropriate to expect anything less than historical revisionism from a company that makes theme parks and children's movies, but I also think it's healthy to critique that which is revisionist and why. What is omitted? What is fabricated? What is appropriate in the context of a film or theme park and what is better suited to a classroom? And for that matter, it's probably healthy to critique the criticism as well. I suspect a good number of the people white knighting for historical accuracy when Disney took the sex trafficking out of its pirate ride probably feel very differently about historical accuracy when someone brings up, say, the 1619 Project. It's important to be critical of things, even things that we like, especially things that we like, and especially things that hold so much power and influence in popular culture. You know, I've, I've talked so much about Disney's depictions of pirates in this essay, but one thing I never hear brought up is how they basically created the idea of pirate speech in the public consciousness. The overripe West Country accent that's so closely associated with piracy that it's an English language option on Facebook originated with Robert Newton in Disney's 1950 adaptation of Treasure Island. And I mean, like... I know most people probably know on some level that pirates didn't talk like that, but that's almost certainly the voice that you hear in your head when you imagine a pirate speaking, isn't it? The, the Disney versions of things very often become the default versions of things. Uh, it's like a Disney hegemony, or I guess I really could have just said American hegemony there. Disney hegemony is American hegemony. Disney is America. America is Disney. A equals B equals C. Anyway, let's talk about America's concentration crisis and the Disney version of imminent world domination. Okay, so before we talk about the future, let's return for a moment to the past. As far back as film's silent era, the major Hollywood studios began attracting the attention of the United States Federal Trade Commission for possible violations of the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. This was the first piece of congressional legislation to outlaw monopolies and price-fixing conspiracies. By the 1930s and 40s, the Big Five, MGM, RKO, 20th Century Fox, and Warner Brothers, and the Little Three, Universal, Columbia, and United Artists, had essentially formed an oligopoly. The studios consolidated power through a practice known as vertical integration, wherein every link along a supply chain is owned by the company. The studios kept writers and actors under exclusive contracts, owned the film's processing and printing labs, and distributed to theaters, many of which were owned by the studios either partially or outright. And even the independent theaters were tightly controlled by the studios through a practice called block booking, wherein a theater had to purchase and screen a studio's films in packages or blocks. Oh, your theater wants access to The Wizard of Oz? Sorry, bud. That means you're also going to have to screen Stronger Than Desire, Andy Hardy Gets Spring Fever, and Fast and Furious? The Department of Justice initially sued the Big Five and the Little Three in 1938, with Paramount, the largest studio, being the primary defendant. And ten years later, in 1948, the case reached the Supreme Court. United States v. Paramount Pictures Incorporated became a landmark case in U.S. antitrust law. The Supreme Court ruled 7-1 to one in favor of the federal government, ultimately forcing the studios to divest their theater holdings and end the practice of block booking entirely. The case is generally credited with being the beginning of the end to the classical Hollywood studio system, leading to a weakening of the Hayes Code and an increase in independent productions and studios that would ultimately coalesce into the auteur era of cinema by the 1970s. In 2019, the Department of Justice sought to terminate the Paramount decrees, and in 2020, the court granted the DOJ's request, beginning a two-year sunset termination period that will come to an end this August. The opinion of the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division is that it is, quote, unlikely that the remaining defendants can reinstate their cartel. 
Perhaps today's Big Five, NBC Universal, Viacom, CBS, Warner Media, Walt Disney Studios, and Sony Pictures won't reinstate a cartel that looks identical to the classical Hollywood studio system, but honey, a cartel has been instated. It's a cartel fueled by streaming, character monopolies, and acquisitions. In addition to the productions that bear their name, Walt Disney Studios currently owns ABC, A&E, ESPN, Fox Sports Network, FX, History Channel, Lifetime, Lucasfilm, National Geographic, Marvel, Pixar, Sky TV, Touchstone Pictures, and Vice Media. It owns a 67% share of Hulu in addition to its own streaming service, Disney+. Plus. Disney's recent acquisition of 20th Century Fox gives it access to Fox's entire catalog and post-release distribution rights for independent theater re-release darlings like Aliens, Titanic, and Fight Club. Disney has a character monopoly not just on the classic Disney animated characters like Mickey Mouse and the Princesses, but Star Wars and Indiana Jones characters, every character in the Buffyverse, and The Simpsons. Disney now owns the exclusive animation comic book and movie rights to all of the Marvel superheroes, including Spider-Man, the X-Men, Deadpool, and Captain America. The acquisition of such wildly popular franchises has allowed them to utterly dominate the market. In 2019, Disney's box office peaked at 40% of all ticket sales and the company reaped a lot of cash from those sales. For theaters that wanted to screen the final installment of the Skywalker saga, The Last Jedi, that year, Disney imposed a set of outrageous terms that harkened back to the old studio days of Hollywood. Disney would get 65% of ticket sales, a new high, and theaters would need to screen The Last Jedi in their largest auditorium for at least four weeks. Any violation of these terms would give Disney the right to garnish an additional 5% from box office revenues. So... 70%. Streaming giants like Netflix, Amazon, and now Disney have been criticized for a business model wherein their streaming services are priced to run on a loss for an indefinite period in order to choke out competitors and seize control of the market. When you've got the money to lose, you can charge less than everyone else and raise monthly subscription fees after crushing the competition. Streaming platforms have also used loopholes and union contracts to skirt around paying actors percentage points on the back end of TV and film projects made exclusively for streaming. Disney's emergence as a monopoly power in the film industry is to the detriment of that industry as a whole. Despite incredible revenues, the company has halved the number of films it produces each year, funneling more and more money into fewer and fewer productions. But bigger budgets don't necessarily mean better quality films are getting made, rather that decisions on what gets greenlit for productions are more risk-averse. If you've wondered why nearly every Disney film is a Marvel, a Star Wars, or a reboot lately, and why the mid-budget movie has all but disappeared from Hollywood, that's why. Meanwhile, independent entertainment companies like A24 are pretty consistently producing critically well-received films, but struggle for spots in major theaters. Because of all the Star Wars. Disney is a threat to the viability of independent films as a whole. And that's just the movie industry, a piddling 17% of Disney's total revenue. Disney also owns GoPro, Hollywood Records, Photobucket, construction companies, venture capital firms, cruise ships, resorts, publishing companies, and a private government district in Florida. You know, because if you're gonna need someone to build the resorts and theme parks people are gonna visit before they board one of your fleet of cruise ships, you may as well own the construction company who does the building, and the venture capital firm that puts up the money for it, and the company that licenses the music that your guests are going to listen to on their vacation, and the technology they're going to take their nice little vacation videos with, and the image hosting service they're going to use to store and print their photos. you got to vertically integrate. The entire U.S. economy, and by extension, a lot of the world economy, is in the midst of a concentration crisis, wherein a handful of companies control an industry, and almost every industry is feeling the crunch. Monopolies within our healthcare industry, or for eyeglasses, or coffins, or whatever, seem at first blush more threatening or more important than entertainment monopolies, but all concentration of power poses a threat to our democracy, as the wealthiest and most powerful will use their resources to rig the system in their favor. Disney has already successfully lobbied the government twice in the past to change copyright law. 
What happens if today's Big Five studios successfully lobby to chip away at our existing antitrust legislation to the benefit of other monopolies like Luxottica or Amazon? What if Disney, a company with a troubled history with labor rights, uses its immense corporate power to further weaken the power of unions? And Disney's monopoly over media ultimately plays into their favor when it comes to controlling the narrative. Here again, we see the themes of narrative and control. Disney owns the American Broadcasting Company, including ABC affiliate local news stations in Fresno, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, New York City, Raleigh, Philadelphia, and Houston. They own Vice News. They own Sky TV. And they have a corporate image that has been so tightly controlled and has garnered such public goodwill for nearly a hundred years now that even the suggestion that they might be doing something unethical is met with knee-jerk defense. Said Senator John Sherman, author of the Sherman Antitrust Act, No problem is more threatening than the inequality of condition, of wealth, and opportunity. If the concerted powers of this combination are entrusted to a single man, it is a kingly prerogative, inconsistent with our form of government. I love Disney. I cry watching almost every one of the movies. I'm the kind of person who will walk around the parks pointing out where there's a hidden Mickey you can only see once a year, or where they painted the walls they didn't want you to notice a certain shade of green that tricks the human brain. Since I was a child, I've known it's all artifice. Paintings on celluloid, plaster and chicken wire, hydraulics in a well-timed audio track. And yet its make-believeness made me love it more. Even now, in the back of my tired, irony-poisoned mind, there's this flicker of optimism that can't be snuffed out. And I think being a Disney kid put it there. All endings are happy, and good will triumph over evil. I just wasn't prepared for the evil to be the company that taught me to root for good. My favorite Tim Burton film is 2003's Big Fish, partly because it's the least hot topic-y of the Burton filmography, but also because it's just like a great movie with strong themes and a lot of pathos. The film, which centers on the strained relationship between a Walt Disney-esque family patriarch and his adult son, deals directly with a conflict between historical truth and myth-making. The film ultimately rules sort of in favor of myth making the case for the way our stories influence not just the way we look at the past, but our entire outlook on the world and how we look to the future. That personal myths are, well, they're not exactly truth, but they can convey a kind of truth, boiling a sequence of facts down to an essence that is more entertaining and philosophically revealing, if not more culturally valuable than a sober recounting of events. The Stephen Sondheim musical Into the Woods similarly deals with the stories we tell our children, but its message is ultimately more... cautionary. If you haven't seen Into the Woods, it's basically like the MCU but with fairy tales, and it interrogates the accepted narratives of those fairy tales and challenges the stories we tell our children and ourselves. In the narratives we create, what do we exaggerate and what do we omit? Are all truths worth knowing? How do our prejudices and biases affect what version of a story is told? What is a story and what is a lie? And how are the narratives we create internalized by both our children and ourselves? In the finale, we hear one of the main characters start to tell his story to his newborn son, but we don't get to hear what version of it he tells. The text encourages us to engage with the parts of the narrative that are uncomfortable or scary, but urges discretion in the retelling. The story of the Walt Disney Company is one of myth, narrative, and control. It is a fantasy, grown from seeds of truth, and cultivated in the imaginations of four generations of business executives, Hollywood creatives, and consumers. When you pass through the gates of Walt's Magic Kingdom, you'll enter the park beneath the tracks of the Disneyland Railroad. Above you, on either side, are two nearly identical plaques that read, Here you leave today and enter the world of yesterday, tomorrow, and fantasy. The plaque is not there for the children who hurry toward Sleeping Beauty's castle through the careful recreation of Walt's Main Street, USA, too quick to notice a silly thing like a plaque. It's there for the adults. 
to grant us permission to see the world as a child might see it once again. To indulge in fantasy. And I think that's good. I think we need fantasy. I think we need artifice. I think we need make-believe as grown-ups almost as much as we needed them as children. I think it's beautiful not to wholly lose sight of that narrative perspective of the world, where good triumphs over evil and everything is pretty, and part of us stays young forever. But knowing what we know now, knowing the parts that are scary and uncomfortable, how much of what's fantasy and how much of what's true will become a part of the story that we tell. Because the Disney version was never enough. Da-da, da-da.